I put out Bibles on the um, ends of the rows, so if you did not have one with you, you could pick one up because we're in John chapter 4 today, and it is a long chapter, and we will be focusing on the entire chapter, more or less, so it will be helpful to you if you have uh, the text open with you so that you can follow along with us. I'm going to begin by just reading uh, the first 15 or so verses of John chapter 4. The Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized but his disciples. When the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour, that would be roughly noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and herds? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Now we're going to start our walk through John chapter 4 with the phrase in verse 4, He had to go through Samaria. That seems like a very simple statement, but it is filled with intense truth. Now, we've got the map up on the screen. You see Judea is in the south. The, the body of water in the bottom is the Dead Sea. The little line going up to the lake at the top is the Jordan River. And up at the top is the Sea of Galilee. The water to the left is, of course, the Mediterranean Sea. Judea is in the south. Galilee is in the north. Samaria is smack dab in the middle. And so if you were going to go from Judea to Galilee or from Galilee to Judea, the most direct route was straight through Samaria. Simple enough. He had to go through Samaria to get from Judea to Galilee except the Jews would not go through Samaria. And here's why. When the Assyrians conquered Israel, you read about it in 2 Kings 17, they took about 27,000 Israelites back to Assyria. They had a very intelligent strategy. When the Assyrians overtook a country, they identified the best and the brightest of that country that they had taken captive and took them back to their country to train them in their ways. You know, if you're going to overtake a country, let's get the best resources they have. That's why you remember Daniel and the three Hebrew children got taken away and taken to, to Nebuchadnezzar's country because that's what their style was. So they took over 27,000 Israelites to Assyria and in exchange, send a bunch of Assyrians to help occupy the land. And so you had Jews and Assyrians, Gentiles, living in that geographic location called Samaria. Now, the Jewish law was very strict. Jews only married Jews. You had to keep the Jewish bloodline pure for the coming of the Messiah. Well, if you're a Jewish lady and you're living next door to a really good-looking Gentile man, you know, eventually you know what happened. Over a period of time, the Assyrians and the Israelites intermarried. 
that's where the Samaritans came from because that's the area where this happened. And so a Samaritan was more than just somebody who lived in Samaria. When the Jews talked about a Samaritan, they were talking about somebody who was a result of an intermarriage between a Gentile and a Jew, which was against the Jewish law, which as far as the devout Jews were concerned, made you unclean. And so they despised Samaritans. That continued to the time of Jesus. When some Jews wanted to show how much they hated Jesus, they called him demon-possessed and a Samaritan, John chapter 8. The animosity was so great that when a Jew was traveling from Galilee to Judea or from Judea to Galilee, they would not go through Samaria. Now, if they went straight, it was about a three-day trip. But they would not do that because they did not even want to set foot in Samaria because they considered it unclean. So they would go up to just north of the Dead Sea, where the border was between Judea and Samaria. They would cross over the Jordan River into that area you see Perea. That was a wilderness, just a barren, desolate wilderness. They would go up the east side of the Jordan River so they got just south of the Sea of Galilee, where the area of Samaria and Galilee met, and would cross the Jordan River again to go into Galilee. If they had gone straight, straight through Samaria, it would have taken them three days. To go and cross the Jordan, go up the Perean wilderness and cross the Jordan again, took them six days. So these people were so angry at the Samaritans and despised them so much, they would not even go through their land. So you go back to your sermon notes now, and we have this phrase in verse 4, he had to go through Samaria. Well, he's saying something there. Because he could have done what everybody else did and just crossed the Jordan River twice, but that's not what he was saying. When Jesus said, I have to go through Samaria, he had to go there because he had to teach his disciples something. He had to teach his disciples that people are not to be judged by what they are on the outside. We are not to judge somebody by their ethnicity or their background or who their parentage is or their economic standard, or their educational level, or what part of the country they're from. Jesus had to go through Samaria, not because there was no other way to get to where he was going, but he had to go through there because he had to take this opportunity to teach his disciples and us that people are not to be judged based on what they are on the outside. But let's be real, you know, we tend to do it still today. C. Welton Gaddy in his book, The Geography of the Soul, says, Prejudice knows no boundaries. Samaria is a rambling, spread out place in the soul. And the closer people get to Samaria, the less concern they have about kindness, sensitivity, and common courtesy. That's pretty powerful. Because let's admit, even among followers of Christ, we tend to judge people based on the kind of church they go to, what kind of architecture the church has, what kind of worship music they use, you know, what kind of the style of worship they use. You know, we, we, we tend to prejudge people based on externals. And Jesus had to go through Samaria to teach us that's not what cuts it in the kingdom of God. When I was thinking about this, I was reminded of a bit that Emo Phillips does. Emo Phillips is a strange, strange comedian. <laughs> if you Google him or go to YouTube and look for him, he is a strange, strange person. But he tells a story of seeing a man on the Golden Gate Bridge about to jump. And he said, I, I wanted to save him from jumping. And so I started talking to him and the man said, I do believe in God. And I said, are you a Christian or a Jew? And he said, a Christian. I said, me too, Protestant or Catholic? He said, Protestant. 
I said, me too. What franchise? He said, Baptist. I said, me too. Northern Baptist or Southern Baptist? He said, Northern Baptist. I said, me too. Northern Conservative Baptist or Northern Liberal Baptist? He says, Northern Conservative Baptist. I said, me too. Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist or Northern Conservative Reform Baptist? And he said, Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist. And I said, me too. Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes Region or Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Eastern Region? And he says, Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes Region. And I said, me too. Y'all been in church long enough to know this, don't you? Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Great Lake Regions Council of 1879 or Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Great Lake Region Council of 1912. And he says, Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Great Lake Regions of 1912. And I said, die, heretic. And I pushed him over the edge. <laughs> that cuts a little too close, though, doesn't it? Because <laughs> that's, you know. And Jesus said, no, i got to go through Samaria to teach you stop judging people based on externals. And throughout his ministry, Jesus taught them this. You think about some of the things in his teachings. His disciples wanted to call fire down from heaven on Samaritans, and Jesus rebuked them. Jesus had an event where 10 lepers came to him to be healed. He healed them. One of those lepers was a Samaritan. One of the lepers came back, only one of the lepers came back to thank Jesus, the Samaritan. You remember the famous story of the good Samaritan? Remember the hero of that story? You know, spoiler alert, it's the Samaritan. So consistently, and in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, one of the last things he told his disciples is be witnesses in Samaria. So, you know, when Jesus is talking about this, as you, as you read through the Gospels now, and you hear him talk about Samaria, and you hear him elevate Samaritans, realize what he's doing. He is teaching you stop judging people based on their ethnicity or based on these externals. You don't do it. <coughs> but in addition to that teaching, Jesus had to go through Samaria because he knew there was a spiritually hungry person there who needed to talk to him. He knew there was a seeker there. And he was teaching us to not overlook the significance and importance of the one. I'm going to reference two or three times probably through the rest of this morning the sermon from March 3rd. Hello, my name is Christopher. If you're watching, please Check that out on our webpage or our YouTube page. Uh, March the 3rd is the sermon that's still up called Hello, My Name is Christopher. We talk in great detail there about the significance of one person to the kingdom of God. And Jesus had to go through Samaria because he knew there was a woman there who was spiritually hungry and needed him to give her the information and the encouragement to take the next step in her search for God. And as I'm studying this, and I'm hung up on that phrase, he had to go through Samaria, I learned that often John uses those words to indicate that God's will and his plan were involved in that. And that got me excited. <laughs> he had to go through Samaria because that was God's will and God's plan. Now, you stop and think about that. As you go through your day, pay attention to God's voice because he has a will and a plan for you too. He has a will and a plan for your day. Have you ever had a sense that maybe I need to take an alternate route to work today and you didn't know why? but you did it and you found out later there was a bad accident or something on where you would have been. Have you ever had one of those situations where you're headed to a store to do your grocery shopping, but, but something comes up 
you know, the store's closed unexpectedly or there's a bad traffic jam and you, you feel like, well, I need to go somewhere else. And when you go to that different store, you run into somebody and have a conversation with them that as you're leaving the store, you think that was a significant thing. That was a God thing. You know, as we go through our days, we need to be aware that God has a will and a plan for our day. And as we begin our day, we pray, God, what do you have for me today? Who do I need to touch today? Who do I need to encourage today? And to live each day on purpose. Let's ask God to make us aware of the divine appointments that he has put in our path. Earlier in my life, I was very calendar driven, very appointment driven. And this was my day. I had it planned out. And if something unusual happened to mess it up, that messed up my whole day. But I learned a very important lesson. And that is that sometimes what I looked at as interruptions in my day were really what God was wanting me to do that day. I had my plan. God has his plan. And he interrupted my plan with his. And I needed to learn to relax that often those interruptions were really God's will and God's plan for me. And so he had to go through Jerusalem because there was one person there who needed him. And it was God's plan and God's will to get them together so that Jesus could help her make the next step in her spiritual service. I tried really hard to come up with an outline for this sermon. Could not do it. I tried to come up with a catchy title to the sermon, and I did. Jesus and the Samaritan Woman. You know? Boy, how catchy is that, right? So I could not come up. This thing just doesn't want to outline itself. And so we're just going to walk through the rest of this chapter. Verse 6, it says that Jesus was tired from the journey. That shows us his humanity. It's about noon, and he's tired. Every once in a while, he just reminds us, you know, I'm human. Yes, I'm God's son, but I'm also human. He was tired. And so he sits and rests at Jacob's well while his disciples go on into the city to get food. Now, apparently, Jesus had already started to wear away at their prejudice, because typically a Jew would not buy food from a Samaritan. Typically, they would not even get a drink of water from a Samaritan, because if a Samaritan touched that water vessel, it became unclean, they thought. And so all through this chapter, Jesus is just smashing their prejudices. So he sits here by the well. That's a rather ordinary thing. You're tired, you sit out where you can find a bench. But in the providence of God, there was a woman, spiritually hungry, open to spiritual truth, comes by. And God uses the most ordinary of circumstances, sitting by a well when you're tired, to reach other people. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago, the May 19th sermon about Capernaum and the miracles in the mundane, in the everyday parts of our life. God wants to do miracles. And so he starts a discussion, and he asks this woman for something to drink, which would have never happened typically. And what is happening here is Jesus is elevating the place of women. We talked about this Mother's Day, how everywhere that Jesus went and everywhere that Christianity has gone, the place of women has been elevated in the society. Now, the strict rabbi, see, again, Everything that Jesus is doing in this chapter, he's teaching something. Because the strict rabbis said that a rabbi could not even greet a female in public, even a member of his own family. So rabbis would not have discussions or conversations with a female in public. In fact, there was a group called the Bruised and Bleeding Pharisees. And they were called that 
Because if they saw a woman coming their way, they would close their eyes. But they kept walking. And so they're always running into things. And they were called, oh, here comes one of the bruised and bleeding Pharisees. Man's religion will make you do stupid things. Not Christianity, but religion. Make you do some stupid things. And I, I just love that. We need to start our own denomination, the bruised and bleeding Pharisees. If you see a woman, close your eyes and keep walking and bump into things. <laughs> That's going to be a good witness for God, right? So here's Jesus, not supposed to even say hello, even to his mother on the street. And he's engaging in conversation with a woman. That's bad enough. A Samaritan, that's even worse, and a Samaritan woman with questionable morals, to say the least. Because in verse 18, we learn, you know, where Jesus asks this little innocuous thing. He says, well, why don't you go get your husband? <laughs> and she goes, uh, I, I really don't have a husband right now. I said, yeah. <laughs> You've had five, and the one you're with now isn't your husband. And she goes, oh, he knows everything I've done. But here is Jesus engaging in a conversation in public with this person. And he elevates the place of women. And he publicly has a discussion with her, teaching people, your man-made religion is way off base. And so he asks her for a drink. And in verse 7, she says, why are you asking me? Again, you know. You're not supposed to do this. You're not supposed to be talking to me. I'm a woman. I'm a Samaritan. If I touch the water vessel and give it to you, you're not going to drink from it because you're going to think it's unclean and you don't have anything to draw from. Now, the well of Jacob was a very deep well. And if you didn't have a bucket, you know, to attach onto that rope and let it down into the well, you couldn't get anything. So what's happening here is he's showing his need and he's asking for help. That's an amazing thing. This is Jesus, the creator, who could have said, let there be a water bucket, and let there be water in the water bucket. But he didn't. He shows his need to this woman. Will you please give me something to drink? And he asks for help. I think this is a missing element in a lot of Christ followers' lives. Somewhere along the line, a lot of people have got the idea that once you become a Christian, you're not supposed to ever acknowledge that you have any need. You're not supposed to ever acknowledge that you need help. You're supposed to have it all together. And so we go through life never asking for help, Surely we're not going to ask somebody who's not a Christian for help. Because if we admit that we have a need, then they're not going to think Jesus can meet all of our needs. And so, and, and Jesus said, no, 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 no. Because you know, if you go through life pretending that you never have a problem, you never have a need, you never have help, you don't come across as being a good follower of Christ. You kind of come across as being arrogant, you know, and holier than thou. And here is Jesus, the creator, showing his need and asking an immoral Samaritan woman for help. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Even if the person is not a follower of Christ, they may be able to help you in some areas of your life. It's okay to show your need. And then starting in verse 10, we have this conversation about living water. That's a phrase that the Jews of the first century used in one of two ways. They meant by it a, a running stream of water, which was always fresher and colder than well water. But it also was used of them to talk about spiritual thirst. And that's obviously what Jesus is talking about here. There's a spiritual thirst in our makeup that can only be met by the living water that Jesus gives us. Psalm 42, 
as the deer pants for streams of water. My soul pants for you, my God. Isaiah 12, with joy, you'll draw water from the wells of salvation. Revelation 22 talks about that river of life that flows from the throne of God. That's where, shall we gather, the river came from. Jeremiah 17 says, the Lord's the spring of living water. And he gives us the invitation in Isaiah 55, come all of you who are thirsty, come to the waters. So Jesus is teaching her and us that there is a thirst within the human soul that can only be met, that can only be quenched, by a relationship with Christ, who is the living water. And so he continues this discussion with this lady. And at some point, she says, let me go back to the town and invite some other people to come here and talk with you. <coughs> Eventually, it seemed like the whole town. Verse 30, they came out of the town and made their way toward Jesus. Uh, there was a bunch of people on their way to come to Jacob's well to talk to him. But this whole process begins with Jesus having to go through Samaria because there's one spiritually hungry lady there who needs to talk to him. And if we're going to be successful at sharing our faith with people, we must understand the importance and the significance of one person. And again, I'm not going to re-preach the Hello, My Name is Christopher sermon, but that's the sermon where we talk about how Billy Graham became a Christian. And, and, and one person, the significance of one person. Because what Christianity is, is discovering the truth and then telling others. And then they discover the truth. It's the old Clairol commercial. And she told two friends, and she told two friends, and she told two friends. That's how Christianity spreads most effectively. And it begins with understanding the significance of one person. So she heads back on, back up to town, to get some people to come in and say, come See a man who told me everything I ever did. This maybe is the Christ. This may be the Messiah. And so while they're coming out of town, his disciples show up with food. Remember, he'd sent them on to get food. And they say, okay, we need to eat. And in verse 32, he says, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? And Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Again, if we're going to be effective in sharing our faith with other people, we need to understand that that's a matter of obedience to Christ. And it's obedience to Christ that gives you strength. He's saying, I get energy, I get strength from doing the will of my Father. And what is the will of the Father? Jesus gave us the Great Commission. Matthew 28, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Sometimes, you know, in churches, we have what we call commissioning services, and we bring people up who are going to go on a mission trip or something. But the, the verb is present tense, and it can be accurately translated this way. As you are going, make disciples. In other words, what Jesus is saying is the will of the Father is that in the daily traffic pattern of our lives, we do what we can to make a follower of Christ. That as we go through our day, as we go through our lives, we ask him to show us opportunities to help somebody make the next step in their spiritual search. Well, how do you do that? Well, you've got to have harvest eyes. In verse 35, he says, you're saying it's four more months till harvest. I say, open your eyes, look at the fields that are ripe for harvest. And, and the King James says those fields are white for harvest. And a lot of scholars think that what he was saying was, look, you know, look up the road. Here comes all these townspeople in their white robes coming to talk to me. This is the harvest that I want you to see. Not the harvest of the wheat or, 
I want you to see the harvest of souls. I want you to see the harvest of people. Look at them coming in their white robes. They're ready to harvest. See them ready for harvest. If you will talk to an orthopedic surgeon, they will talk to you about your bone structure. When my brother-in-law was in school for oral surgery, when you came around him, you wanted to cover your, your jaw because that's what he saw when he looked at you. I mean, that's what he was doing. That's what he was studying for. And when he looked at you, he saw your jaw alignment. He saw whether you needed surgery or not because that's the way he saw people because that's who he was. As we go through our days as followers of Christ, we need to ask him to help us to see them with harvest eyes. That is to say, these are people for whom Christ died. I don't know. I've got some people in my jobs. I don't know if you've ever had anybody on your job that was hard to see that way. You know? <laughs> Either this is just a jerk. You know, this is just a pain. But no, Jesus wants me to look at them with harvest eyes. Jesus wants me to look at them as someone for whom Christ died. And so he continues, verse 36, even now the reaper draws his wages. Even now he harvests the crops for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. I say you to reap what you've not worked for. Others have done the hard work. You've reaped the benefits of the labor. And the next verse says, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of that woman's testimony. You never know the significance of that one person that you have a part in their coming to know Christ. And what we have to do if we're going to be faithful at sharing our faith is to remember that evangelism is a process. Evangelism is not an event. Evangelism is a process. And it involves more than just me. <laughs> Those verses we just read in John 4, the one who reaps, the one who harvests, and you may reap things you've never worked for, but they all reap the benefits. It's very similar to what years later Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 3. When people are saying, well, I follow Apollos or I follow Paul. He says, what after all is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. But the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor, for we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, you are God's building. Jesus is teaching us something very critical here, and Paul affirms it. If you study how people come to faith in Christ. If you will reflect on how you came to faith in Christ, there's a process. It rarely happens in one conversation. And when it seems to happen all at once, if you dig deeper, you'll find out that somebody's been praying for that person for a long time, or they've been on a spiritual journey for quite a while. You just happen to be there on harvest day. But there's a process, and both Jesus and Paul talk about fields, talk about seed. And so you, you stop and think. There is a cultivating process where the soil is broken up so that it can receive the seed, and then the seed is planted, and then there's weeding and watering and continuing to cultivate the seed, and then one day there's a harvest. That same process is how people find Christ. Typically, you know, if somebody is hostile or arrogant toward Christ or church, that antagonism, that hostility has to be broken down. 
right? People aren't going to accept your invitation to come to Christ if they're angry at church or angry at God. You've got to break that down. And God typically uses people to do that. People who are friendly and kind and warm-hearted and non-judgmental and good listeners and, and who are there and their response to that person's anger and hostility starts to break up the soil, starts to tear down that anger and that hostility. And over time, that wall starts to come down. And the soil begins to be prepared to receive the seed. And maybe somebody got up enough courage to invite that person to come to a Christmas service or an Easter service and they agreed to do it. Or, or maybe God showed up in one of their dreams or maybe they had the birth of a child. It's amazing how many times the birth of a child stimulates somebody to get back to church. Or maybe they're punching the buttons on their car radio and, and they hear a scripture verse or part of a Christian song or they're flipping channels on the television and somebody is saying something right at the right time and the seed begins to get planted. And then there's somebody else who keeps encouraging them. That's why we talk about the most effective evangelism happens in the, in the area of, in the arena of relationships. Because they, they have somebody with them now as they're starting to ask more serious questions, as they're starting to say, well, you know, how do you read the Bible anyway? And, and, and tell me again why you believe in God. And, and, and that cultivation of the seed continues until one day they say, I'm ready to give my life to Christ. It's a process. And what Jesus and Paul both teach us is that whether you were responsible for starting to break up the ground or you were there on harvest day, you all fulfilled the task, did you catch what Paul said? That the Lord assigned to you and you will each have your reward. Now we humans give the glory to the person who was there at harvest time. I preached and 25 people came to know Christ. Wonderful. Do you know the story of those 25 people? <laughs> and how many people along their lives God led to them that were instrumental in the process of getting them ready to say yes? See, God looks at things differently than we do. Don't, don't be discouraged if you feel like all you ever get to do is be a cultivator. All I, all I ever get to do is just talk to people. All I ever get to do is just answer their questions and just, just listen to them and, and try to be nice to them and try to be kind to them and, and hope that maybe one day they'll come running up to me and say, what must I do to be saved? Hasn't happened to me much. You know? Doesn't happen much that way. There's a process. And you're a part of the process. And whatever part God has assigned to you in that process, be faithful in that process. If it's a ground breaker upper, you know, that's hard work. The tilling of the ground, breaking up that hard heart, listening enough and being non-judgmental enough to let them express their frustrations and, and get it all out of it and start to be softened toward God. I believe when we get to heaven, there's going to be a lot of cultivators there who think they were never responsible for anybody coming to faith. And God's going to show them how their kindness, maybe their sense of humor, their listening ear, their words of encouragement were responsible to start the process of that person coming to faith in Christ. And they never knew about it. But when we get to heaven, God's going to say, see, your cultivation was the beginning of the process. And if you hadn't been there, maybe that process would have never ended up with them coming to faith. So Jesus says, sometimes others do the hard work and you get to reap the benefits. It's kind of what was happening that day. Jesus had done the hard work with the Samaritan woman. And now here come all these people saying, 
Are you the Messiah? And his disciples get to do the reaping. But it's all part of the same process. Don't ever get discouraged. Don't ever let some preacher say, if you've never personally led somebody to Christ, you're not a good Christian. No, you may be a cultivator. God may have assigned you to be a seed waterer. Whatever your assignment is, be faithful because it's a process and God rewards faithfulness. As I was mulling on this, and, and I was not prepared for this sermon to take the turn that it took, you know, into basically being focused on, here's what Jesus is saying about how we share our faith. I remembered a song from a guy named Gordon Jensen. He has written songs you know about, but you probably don't know him. But he wrote what I think is a very powerful song that we're going to close with today. If you're watching, you can find it. It's on YouTube. It's called You're the Only Jesus by Gordon Jensen. The words will be on the screen. Listen to it, please, as we close. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine on you and give you his peace now and evermore. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for coming out today. Let him shine through you.